our third presenter is Zach, and uh, his the paper is titled Affirmative Action, Mismatch, and Economic uh, Mobility after California's Proposition 209. Uh, welcome, Zach. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, I'll just note that this paper has been published. So I, I just put the link uh, to a, um, uh, an unblocked version of the paper if anyone's interested. This is a paper about race-based affirmative action in undergraduate admissions. Uh, so uh, I think in many ways similar to the two papers that preceded, but let me just uh, sort of set the scene here. Uh, many selective universities in the US and around the world uh, use race-based affirmative action to identify, admit, and enroll underrepresented minority applicants. As I, uh, we all know, this is motivated by large persistent racial disparities across the board. I'm not gonna say so much more about that, but it's worth emphasizing that race-based affirmative action is politically and academically controversial. On the academic side, there's this concern that affirmative action could lead to academic mismatch that would limit the return to selective university enrollment for the perhaps underprepared students targeted by race-based affirmative action. This is a big paper that tries to answer every question you might have about how affirmative action works and what happens to students as a result of it. Today's talk is short. I'm gonna to try to go lead you through three primary questions around this policy. The first is which students are targeted by affirmative action and to what degree or, or in what way does affirmative action shape which universities those students attend? Second, I'll ask what are the short and long run effects of enrolling at a more selective university as a result of affirmative action? And then finally, I'll just I'll say a little bit at the end about the net benefits and costs of affirmative action policies on Asian and white students who are perhaps crowded out by the black and Hispanic students who are targeted by this policy. Today's setting is going to be Proposition 209, a major policy shift in the state of California starting in 1998 that prohibited universities from implementing affirmative action in its admissions policies. I'm gonna be using data from the University of California and a difference in difference design to try to understand the ramifications of this policy change that banned affirmative action. To very quickly preview what I'm about to show you, I'm gonna show you that affirmative action provided very large admissions advantages to targeted applicants and that banning this policy thus caused a cascade of black and Hispanic university applicants into somewhat less selective universities than each of those students would have otherwise enrolled at. And as a result, those URM applicants face substantial declines, both overall uh, uh, in terms of degree attainment at the undergraduate and graduate level, and in terms of STEM degree attainment at both of those levels. And they saw persistent wage declines on the order of five percentage points in the reduced form across all Black and Hispanic uh, young California college applicants uh, that persisted at least 15 years beyond the policy implementation. Uh, as a result, you can add up the number of uh, high income Black and Hispanic young Californians that would exist if they continued to have access to affirmative action when they had applied to college years earlier, it looks like there's a decline in these high earning uh, youths earnings uh, by about three percentage points. Um, though this is wholly driven by Hispanic college applicants, not black college applicants. And uh, I may have just a moment at the end to show you a little bit about what happens to the grades and STEM persistence of black and Hispanic students who end up enrolling at less selective universities because of this affirmative action ban. And I'll show you that there's no effect on either STEM persistence or performance. And finally, I'll show you some suggestive evidence that affirmative actions benefits to these black and Hispanic applicants appear to pretty substantially exceed the net costs faced by the white and Asian students who had been crowded out by the policy. Uh, there's a lot of prior literature on this question. I'm not going to say anything about it today. Instead, let me tell you a little bit about affirmative action and the state of California. So the University of California comprises all of the large public research universities in the state of California. Um, it enrolled about 140,000 students in the late 1990s, which is between two and three percentage points of all college students in the U.S. These uh, University of California ranges in selectivity from its most selective Berkeley and UCLA campuses down to its least selective Santa Cruz and Riverside campuses, though all of these schools uh, from a national uh, point of view are selective and uh, high performing. All of these campuses simultaneously uh, were also getting uh, more selective over time. 
These schools practiced race-based affirmative action in their admissions policies from the 1970s until 1998 when, they were, uh, when that policy was prohibited by a ballot proposition in California. And the policy was not replaced until about three years later when the university implemented a top percent policy. Uh, though again, because it was so many years later, I'm not gonna say so much about it today. And prior to 1998, the University of California's admissions policies were largely determined by students' race and their academic index, which I state here below is just a weighted average of their high school grades and their standardized test scores on the SAT. Okay, so that's a lot of text. Now let me just show you what's going on with this policy. So uh, this is an archival admissions document from UC Berkeley that shows you the, the, the admissions mechanism implemented by that university in 1995. You'll see there's two axes here along the uh, horizontal axis. I'm sorry, this is a bit small. You can see students' academic indices in bins. This, this is a total score out of 8,000 points. And then along the vertical axis here, you have this social diversity index for students that ranges from A to I. So for example, a high income African-American university applicant is a social diversity uh, status B, whereas a non-California resident white applicant uh, would be uh, social diversity status H. You can see the higher your social diversity status, the lower an academic index you need to be guaranteed admission to the University of California at Berkeley. So a typical black applicant would have been guaranteed admission with a 6250 uh, uh, academic index, whereas a typical white applicant would have to have a, a thousand additional academic index points in order to be guaranteed admission. There's a gray area here in between called read. That means that a number of application readers went through the application and about half of these students were admitted. And then all of these students with lower academic indices or social diversity indices were rejected outright from Berkeley. Okay, so just to now uh, try to visualize in the data what that mechanism looks like, I'm gonna use three sources of data in this study. The first is a comprehensive database of undergraduate applicants to the University of California in the years before and after this ban of the policy. And then I'm going to link all of those applicants to National Student Clearinghouse records, which let me see where they go to college, so long as they go to college, what degrees they earn and what their majors were, no matter where they are in the US. And I'm going to link them to uh, uh, wage records that are measured at the annual level in the state of California. The paper goes through a number of other databases. I'm not going to have time to go through that today. Let me instead show you what admissions look like at uh, a particular campus. Again, I'm going to focus on UC Berkeley in the years uh, just before, and then the year just after affirmative action was prohibited at this university. In red dots, you can see the student's likelihood of admission if they were URM along the academic index distribution in 1997. And you can see that URM students relative to non-URM students were very substantially more likely to be admitted to UC Berkeley in a wide range of academic indices. They effectively had a guarantee up to about a 6,500 whereas white students and Asian students only had a guarantee up to about a 7,500. And then even uh, in that intermediate read range, you can see that for instance, for students with a 6,500 academic index, black and Hispanic students had an 80 percentage point likelihood of being admitted to Berkeley, where white and Asian students had almost a 0% chance of being admitted. That changes very dramatically in 1998. This is not a light touch policy. This is providing very large admissions advantages to a large number of applicants. And so when Prop 209 is implemented and affirmative action ends, Black and Hispanic students' likelihood of admission declines precipitously, though it doesn't decline all the way to the same admissions likelihood as white and Asian students. This is because Black and Hispanic students must have had other characteristics on their applications that were correlated with admissions likelihood even within academic index bin. Okay, so that's what affirmative action was doing. It was identifying Black and Hispanic students with relatively low academic indices at these universities and was guaranteeing them admission in a way that was not provided to white and Asian students. When affirmative action ends, therefore, you get this cascade of students across universities as, as ranked by selectivity. So what I'm showing you here is a more selective, middle selective, and less selective group of California universities. In black, you can see across the academic index distribution, students changed likelihood of enrolling at each of these set of universities. And then in this gray line, you can see the change for non-URM students. Now, what you can see in this figure is that relative to non-URM students, among high academic index students, there was an increased likelihood of enrolling at UC San Diego. These are students who would have otherwise gone to Berkeley and UCLA, but lost access and go to San Diego instead. But then there's a group of students at the middle of the academic index distribution who become less likely to
to enroll at San Diego as a result of Prop 209. Okay, where did those students go? Well, those students became more likely to enroll relatively at the middle selective University of California campuses, whereas students at the bottom of the academic index distribution are pushed out of the middle selective schools and pushed into the California State University system, the least selective of the California universities. What I want you to take away from this is that Prop 209 caused this cascade of Black and Hispanic students. No one was pushed out of higher education altogether, or at least it seems like very few were, but everyone was pushed to a somewhat less selective university than they would have otherwise attended. Okay, so what happens to these students in the longer run as a result of this change in university selectivity? I'm gonna um, set up a very standard difference in difference design. The equation is here, though I think it's gonna be easier to understand just to look at some figures. So what I'm showing you here is along the x-axis, cohorts of students who are applying to the University of California. This is the final cohort that applied to the university prior to the ban on affirmative action. And what I'm showing you is outcomes among those Black and Hispanic applicants to the university relative to academically similar white and Asian applicants in their same cohort. You can see leading up to the ban, there was no change relative to the year prior to the ban in these students' institutional wage value added. This is a measure of the quality of university that these students are enrolling at following a paper by Raj Jetty and co-authors last year. But in 1998, you can see this substantial decline in Black and Hispanic students' institutional wage value add, which is to say on average, Black and Hispanic students are enrolling at lower value add universities. In universities that on average uh, led their uh, uh, graduates to earn about $1,000 less each year than they would have otherwise. What was the ramification of enrolling at the lower value add institutions? Well, Black and Hispanic students' likelihood of earning a college degree within six years fell on average across all of these students here focusing on uh, students in the bottom uh, quartile of the academic index distribution. These students became less likely to earn college degrees at all. Moving past college degrees to STEM degree attainment, you see in both unconditional and conditional decline in these students' overall likelihood of earning a degree in science and engineering. You see a decline in these students' likelihood of earning any graduate degree. You see a decline in students' uh, uh, annual earnings, here measured as log wages, six to 16 years after they applied to college. So you know, call it in their mid to late 20s and early 30s. You can see there's a little bit of evidence of pre-trend here in the years before the policy was implemented. It looks like Black and Hispanic students had higher earnings. This is because of changes in the ethnic wage distribution of uh, young uh, uh, workers in the state of California. If instead you look at these students' uh, ethnicity specific wage percentile, so how these students are doing in the California labor market relative to uh, other similar ethnicity peers also working in that labor market, you can see these students uh, fell in that wage percentile distribution by about two percentage points following the impl uh, imposition of Prop 209, and so after these students lost access to selective universities. Okay, so just to give a, a quantification of in aggregate, what was the result of Prop 209 on the California labor market? What I'm showing you in these figures is in, uh, in number of years after these students exited the University of California or whatever other university they went to, what was the change in the cohorts after Prop 209's earnings relative to, to the earnings of similar uh, uh, academically prepared Black and Hispanic students who had access to affirmative action? You can see there's this persistent decline in log wages or this decline in their likelihood of earning at least $100,000 a year that doesn't seem to be improving as they enter their mid thirties, many years after they've gone to college. Focusing for just a moment on this decline in students' likelihood of earning at least $100,000 a year, we can just add up, okay, how many applicants are there? There were about 56,000 in a five-year window, uh, so uh, represented by these five years. And uh, Prop 209 became, made each of them about 1.3 percentage points less likely to have this high level of earnings in their early 30s than they would have been if they'd had access to more selective universities as a result of affirmative action. Again, uh, just adding that up, that means that there were about 700 young Black and Hispanic workers in the state who uh, were unable to have high earnings because they didn't have access to selective universities. And in net, that's going to be a decline of about three percentage points in the total number of high earning Black and Hispanic workers in the state as a result of this policy. 
Dina just turned on her camera, so I think that means I'm supposed to finish up. Um, so, uh, so the paper goes through a lot of additional results, focusing on changes in the income distribution of students at these universities, in their performance and persistence in STEM courses, as well as a series of robustness checks. I'm not going to say anything about that now. The paper also uh, goes through a series of exercises trying to understand the impact of ending affirmative action on white and Asian students' outcomes. And I find essentially no evidence that the end of affirmative action led white and Asian students to improve their either degree attainment or early career earnings uh, uh, in the years uh, thereafter. Um, though uh, uh, I, th I think the identification strategy is somewhat weaker in those cases. Instead, let me just conclude what I want you to take away from this talk is that ending a race-based affirmative action policy in California seems to have caused thousands of black and Hispanic students to cascade into less selective universities. Though you might have thought that that would have been easier for them, uh, and so this might have led to benefits for those students. In fact, Prop 209 led to pretty substantial declines in both degree attainment and early career earnings that appear at, in the aggregate level when you look at the California labor market 15 years later. These findings are inconsistent with what the so-called university mismatch hypothesis, the notion that students ought to attend universities uh, where they uh, have very similar academic preparedness to their peers. And this is going to provide the first causal evidence that banning affirmative action exacerbates pre-existing socioeconomic inequities. I'm going to end there. I'm happy to take questions. Thanks all for staying, I think, uh, at a seminar that went far over its time. Yeah. Thank you so much, Zach. Um, we have one question on the Q&A tool uh, on uh, you claim that the benefits to Blacks and Latino uh, students outweigh the costs to whites and Asians. That means the policy appears to have been efficient, according to the Carlo Hicks criteria. But in this space, uh, we seem to care more about equity than efficiency. Would you argue that affirmative action is also equitable or is that question outside the, the scope of your work? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So uh, efficiency, there's a sense in which the equity concern here is very easy to answer, um, right? The equity question is just what happened to black and Hispanic students relative to white and Asian students? And the answer is that black and Hispanic students benefited. And so that's going to close equity gaps as a result of affirmative action, which is to say ending affirmative action uh, has uh, neg negative uh, uh, equity ramifications. Um, the paper then goes on to this section about efficiency, but, uh, uh, but I think provides a lot of evidence that, uh, that affirmative action policies are equitable, which is to say provide benefits to students who are targeted by the policies. Let me quickly also answer, Zoe had a question about whether these uh, results are conditional on applying to the University of California. They are. There was some evidence that Black and Hispanic students uh, pulled back from applying to the university as a result of this affirmative action ban on the order of about 12 percentage points. Uh, the paper has a long section going through whether uh, that's going to lead to sample selection bias and uh, what are the other ramifications of Black and Hispanic students exiting uh, these applications um, uh, uh, as a result of the policy. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have more time to say uh, more about that, but uh, it's, it's the right question to ask. 